Hi, I'm Christopher Millard. I'm off council with Bristow's and Professor of Privacy and Information Law at Queen Mary University of London, where I lead the cloud legal project. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about cloud computing contracts. Quite often, when, pe when I tell people that I'm working on cloud computing law, they say to me, well, there's nothing really new about cloud computing. It's just another form of outsourcing. And those of you who've been in the IT industry or who have dealt with computer contracts over the years will be very familiar with outsourcing, which is a description of how a company or a government agency or some other body will take its existing business processes or specifically its IT systems and services and they will take them from inside their organization and move them out to an external service provider. That's why it's called outsourcing. So it's something you used to do internally, you move outside. And in, particularly in relation to IT uh, procurement, a lot of people say, well, that's all you're doing really with cloud computing. You're just buying the IT service in a different way. I think, however, there are some crucial differences. And failure to understand those differences can lead to significant um, un misunderstood and mismanaged risks in cloud computing procurement. So what's different about cloud computing services and cloud computing contracts. Well, first of all, unlike the traditional scenario I described, where you already have IT infrastructure, you've got hardware, you've got software, you've got your IT um, specialists in-house and everybody you need to do support and maintenance and help desk and so on. In cloud procurement, typically, the movement is entirely in the opposite direction. This isn't taking stuff you've already built and run and moving it out of the organization. It's buying something as a service. And that's why we talk about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. These are not things you already own and have built and have run and understand that you're moving out. This is a completely new way of buying computing capacity and storage. So the direction of travel and the sequence of events, I think, is, is crucial. The, the cloud provider, the cloud service provider, doesn't take over your existing arrangements. Rather, you as a customer go out and you buy a service. And that service is usually highly standardized, highly commoditized. Indeed, some people would describe it as effectively a utility service, where it's take it or leave it. Here's the processing uh, capability. Here is the storage capability. Here are the other features. Do you want them or not? So think of cloud more in terms of standardized shared infrastructure and standardized commoditized products. Now, there are exceptions to that, and I will get to them in a few minutes. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, implications of buying standardized IT services instead of procuring customized outsourcing services. What should you look out for if you engage in uh, purchasing standard cloud services off the virtual shelf, if I can call it that. Well, it's a bit like really buying other online services or products by the internet. Typically, you really don't have much choice as to what you get. And in particular, you usually don't have any choice about the contract. So most cloud computing services are bought using a click-through arrangement, a bit like you would click through in an e-commerce store to buy physical goods or, or services such as movies and music and so on, where you don't have any chance to negotiate the contract. And in practice, most people don't even read it. Now, you may say, well, so what? We're all used to that. That's how people do stuff on the internet these days. Well, don't be so quick to assume that that is free of risk just because it's so easy and quick. In fact, what's happening at the moment is a lot of companies, and even in some cases we've found government departments, are buying cloud services just by clicking through and not attempting to negotiate any of the terms of service. And that can carry significant uh, risks. So for example, in an analysis of more than 30 standard cloud contracts that was undertaken by the Cloud Legal Project at Queen Mary University of London, we found that many of those contracts contained clauses which you couldn't negotiate, which were uh, totally inappropriate, really, to the kind of service you think you're buying, they may, may well indeed be uh, unenforceable. And in some cases, if they're dealing with consumers, the clauses may be illegal. Um, the sort of things that 
people tend not to even think about when they're buying a service at the beginning is what happens if I want to move all my data later to another service and this could be if you're a business it could be your HR data or your customer data and if you're a consumer it could be your photos it could be anything else that you've stored in the cloud can you actually move that to another cloud service provider can you effectively get it back and can you get all the other information which we call metadata which is extra value-added information about the material you've stored in the first uh, cloud service. And secondly, what do you do if this cloud service, which you may be relying on to give you um, a backup of your data, indeed it may be the only copy of your data at a particular moment, what happens if that service fails? Or what happens if it's closed down? Um, or if it's taken over and replaced by a different service that is no use to you? All of these things have already happened in cloud computing. Most people just don't think about it at the beginning. And third example is, what happens if something goes badly wrong and you can't service your customers, um, you lose out on a lot of transactions, uh, you are exposed to financial penalties, there's all, many other things that can go wrong in business when you depend on a third party to provide you with something like a cloud computing service. These standard contracts typically contain very broad, very sweeping, quite extreme in some cases, exclusions of liability and disclaimers um, in the event that things go wrong. And we found by talking to customers, by analyzing these contracts, and by talking to service providers, that in many cases, uh, even large organizations, very sophisticated purchasers of computing services, uh, find that many of their employees, often without telling the IT department uh, or anybody else involved in managing um, computing resources, many individuals are using corporate credit cards or even their own credit cards, going out and buying cloud computing, processing power, and storage for business purposes, starting maybe very small scale, doing pilot projects, but quite rapidly scaling up. We had some cases where um, cloud providers uh, said that they had pointed out to what are now some of their larger customers that they were already using uh, thousands of accounts. Um, it's just that none of them had gone through any kind of central procurement um, process. So this is really happening out there in the market. So I want to move on now to the second uh, type of contract. I've talked about standard contracts that you can't negotiate and that many people don't even read, but which may still uh, be important in terms of management of legal and other risks. What about, though, negotiating cloud contracts? Let's say you are a large company, a large business, um, or you're maybe a government uh, department or other government agency, and you want to spend a lot of money, and you want to do stuff which is actually uh, high risk, high visibility, it may be mission critical, really, for you as an organization. Can you negotiate a better deal with a cloud service provider? Now, the answer that you will typically hear from the cloud computing industry and which, interestingly, most people believe to be true, is no. Sorry, it's take it or leave it. You take our terms of service, you take our service as it is currently configured, or you'll just have to walk away. Actually, that's not true. And we have proved that, again, by doing empirical research, and we found that there are many cases where cloud computing service providers are prepared to depart from their standard offers and their standard terms of service. Effectively, they're prepared to go off-piste and do a special deal. And these tend to be in situations either where it's a very big ticket purchase of cloud computing services, uh, or where it's an opportunity for the cloud service provider to start doing business with a customer that they see as strategic in terms of growth potential or profile, or maybe as strategic in terms of a way of getting into a specific industry sector that could produce a lot of business for the cloud service provider in future. So actually, uh, cloud computing contracts can be negotiated, and they are negotiated increasingly, but only in certain circumstances where it's really worth the time and the effort and the expense for the service provider to do a special deal. So in those cases where cloud computing contracts are negotiated, what gets negotiated in practice? What are the most contentious, the most heavily negotiated areas in these cloud contracts. Now, in a study, again, conducted by the Cloud Legal Project, where we talked to um, service providers, we talked to customers, we talked to intermediaries managing risks, such as the insurance industry, lawyers and others, uh, we tried to find out, by talking to a lot of people and by also analysing a lot of other sources, what are the most controversial 
areas that are negotiated in cloud computing contracts. And here they are. Here are the top six at any rate. Um, the first one, which you may be not surprised to hear given what I said earlier about the typical clauses you get in standard cloud contracts, the first one is exclusion and limitation of liability. Now, most uh, consumers and many small and medium-sized businesses and even some large organizations just seem to be accepting uh, draconian exclusions and limitations of liability. But for the ones that are prepared to take the time and the trouble to read the small print, think about whether it's really appropriate to the way they want to use cloud computing, it turns out that it is possible to negotiate with service providers, at least for major deals. And that is the number one issue that gets raised in negotiations. Second issue is service levels. Again, I said earlier, for most people, cloud computing is a standardized, commoditized, take it or leave it type of service. But that isn't good enough for some organizations. Let's say you have commitments to very large numbers of customers and you have to deliver a certain service on time to a certain standard. And this could be in the private sector, it could be in the public sector, for example, in healthcare and other areas like that, uh, whether that's private or public. Service levels can be a, a crucial sticking point in cloud negotiations because it may be difficult for the service provider to actually customize the service levels for a particular um, customer, but it may be worth it on both sides and it does happen sometimes in practice. The third hottest area for negotiation and sometimes a deal breaker uh, is the whole area of security and privacy. And indeed, those two things are frequently quoted as reasons why both businesses and governments don't want to use cloud computing. They don't believe that it is as secure and as compliant in terms of data protection law, for example, as doing the processing, doing the storage, etc., themselves. Now, it turns out when these things get negotiated um, at a decent level of detail, that is often not true because uh, we have all seen, I'm sure, in the press, many examples of very large and sophisticated uh, businesses and governments that have lost a lot of data about their customers, about their citizens. And data breaches, or, as they're often called, uh, are a major issue at the moment and a major cause of concern for data protection regulators and for other regulators, such as financial services regulators and so on. And it may be that for certainly for small and medium sized businesses on the whole, but even for very large businesses and government departments and agencies, it may be that a cloud service provider whose whole business is built around managing data and keeping it secure, it may turn out that they're better at security and compliance, or at least at facilitating compliance um, on the part of the customer than the customer would be doing its own processing and storage. A fourth uh, hot area for negotiation is lock-in and exit. This concerns uh, what happens if you want to get out of a cloud computing arrangement. Traditional outsourcing deals uh, that I mentioned earlier, traditionally outsourcing deals are heavily negotiated. Uh, they take many months to agree and uh, large groups of specialists are involved on both sides typically of a deal in negotiating it. So for a customer that will include the IT professionals, but it will also include uh, risk management teams and uh, the legal department, maybe insurers, privacy professionals and so on. Um, and these deals often last for a long time. They're often for five to seven years and have then very complicated um, clauses built into them and schedules that deal with things like change control. Can you change the outsourcing deal while it's running live? Uh, but they also deal with issues to do with exit. What happens on termination? Can we get the know-how back? Can we get the metadata back? Can we get all our information back in a form that we can use it ourselves or transfer to another service provider? These are uh, big concerns as well in terms of cloud computing contracts. And standard terms of service for cloud computing often are not terribly helpful to the customer in terms of what happens uh, at the end. Maybe it's one of those happy things where people think they're going to be friends for life and, and so on, but unfortunately IT deals uh, quite often go wrong or quite often people want to move to another provider for uh, different um, uh, services or for better prices or whatever. So lock-in and exit is important. The fifth topic is 
that standard cloud contracts usually give the service provider significant discretion in changing the service and doing it usually without the consent of the customer. Now, in some ways, that's understandable. If you are a, a world-class, world-scale cloud computing infrastructure provider and you have many millions of customers, you can hardly go out and consult with them all individually before you make technical changes to your service. Um, however, for large customers, as I said earlier, perhaps doing mission critical things in the cloud, it isn't good enough just to be told or maybe just to find out without being told that some technical features or some service levels or something else that's important to you has been changed in the cloud service and you didn't know about it, you didn't get a chance to object. So in some of these negotiated deals, the providers um, agree that at the very least they will give uh, customers notice. They will warn them if they're going to make changes. There may then be an opportunity to have some kind of a dialogue about the implications of that and an opportunity if it really can't be resolved for the customer to leave the contract early. And the sixth area that gets heavily negotiated uh, in practice concerns ownership and use of data in the cloud. I'm not talking here about privacy and data protection, I'm talking more about intellectual property rights. Who actually owns the data in cloud ecosystems that are being used for a particular customer at a particular time? And in particular, who owns the, the metadata, the value-added data about data that is generated when you use a cloud service? And uh, traditionally, standard form cloud contracts are not always clear about that. There is a popular fear in the market which we found to be wrong, which is some people say, oh, if you put your data in the cloud, uh, whether it's your proprietary know-how or your photos or your music or whatever, then the cloud service provider will put in their contract that they will then own your data. That actually is not the case, and we have not found that in the analysis we've done of contracts. However, there is uncertainty and often lack of clarity about the other types of data that are generated when you're using a cloud computing service, and that is an area that also gets negotiated. Thanks very much for listening.